and it's um, lovely to be here. So I'm an archaeologist and I'm doing my PhD at Flinders University and the focus of my research is Irish social identity in 19th century South Australia. Um, so basically I'm looking at Irishness in South Australia. And my presentation this evening is about the archaeology of a little known 19th century Irish settlement in the mid-north of South Australia known as Baker's Flat near Kapanda. Now, it's interesting because little archaeological work has been carried out specifically on the Irish in Australia until now. There's been lots of archaeological work done in the eastern states and many of them have been on working class areas like the Rocks in Sydney, Little Lawn in Melbourne. And they certainly have had Irish people living in them. But nothing has been done specifically about the Irish archaeologically. Then when we look historically, the research in South Australia, it tends to present the Irish as a people who arrived, blended into the broader community, and quickly became indistinguishable from British migrants. And I think a number of people that I've spoken to already in the room have indicated that they have Irish ancestry. And I don't think anybody would say the Irish are exactly the same as the British. <laughs> so like, this view of the Irish as indistinguishable from the British is at odds with the Baker's Flat site which is documented in the historical records as a set-apart Irish settlement and which persisted as a discrete community for more than 70 years. So Baker's Flat is different. It's a recognisably Irish community in a rural setting and it lasted for more than 70 years, from the 1850s to at least the 1920s. So it's located just outside the town of Kapanda, which um, I guess everybody knows is about 75 kilometres north of Adelaide, as the crow flies, in the mid-north. It's on the traditional lands of the Nadjari people, and it was settled by Europeans in 1842. So during the 19th century, Kapanda was one of South Australia's major towns and it had a population of about 2,000 people. Copper was discovered there in 1842 and it was actually discovered by two people, one of whom was a small child, around 12 years old, who was the son of Captain Baggett, one of the early settlers in the Kapanda area, who actually came as a land agent and was of Anglo-Irish background. So the Irish were there very early. The mine began operating in 1844, and it was Australia's first successful metal mine. It helped to save the early colony of South Australia from bankruptcy in the 1840s. And by the 1860s, the mine was Australia's largest. So jobs at the mine were what attracted the Irish in the first place. It also attracted Cornish miners, Welsh smelters, German smelters and farmers, and of course, the English landowners. And there's still a very strong Cornish influence in Kapanda. And this big statue of a Cornish miner is what greets you as you come in on the Adelaide Road from Kapanda. And I guess if you've been up that road, most of you would have seen Matt Colonel. And he had an unfortunate end for a while when somebody burnt him down. And then they made him again. But anyway, it's sort of that Cornish influence is the sort of the Celtic influence that's strong in Kapanda. And the Irish influence is much more subtle and really, in many ways, I would argue that it's sort of completely disappeared from sort of contemporary knowledge. But from 1854, 10 years after the mine started operations, and after the famine, Irish Catholics began to arrive in large numbers at Kapanda, and mainly they were to take up labouring jobs at the Copper. So they settled on a vacant area of land known as Baker's Flat. And it was called Baker's Flat because it was owned primarily by two people who were the Bakers. And also it was very flat. Although well, there is a bit of a rise. Um, so Baker's Flat, it was available, it was rent free, it was conveniently close to the mine site. So the new occupiers quickly formed what was described as a close fiercely Irish community. 
And there are estimates of about 500 people living on Baker's Flat when the mine was at its peak in the 1860s and 1870s. So the Irish at Baker's Flat, they built houses that looked like Irish houses. They had a very strong Catholic faith. They kept up traditional recreational activities such as Irish dancing. There were hurling matches on Baker's Flat. And they continued to follow an Irish lifestyle, including communal and cooperative farming. But they weren't very popular locally in the broader community. So the general feeling was that they drank too much, <laughs> that they were dirty, which is an argument that I always hate, because everybody was dirty in the 19th century. <laughs> it wasn't just the Irish. Everybody was dirty, and there wasn't a lot of water at the panda. So anyway, they were dirty, they were lawless, they didn't manage their animals in the approved way. And the animals were renowned for roaming freely without fences. So Baker's Flat was described on more than one occasion as a blot on the landscape. So I want to go back to Ireland for a moment just to talk about the famine for people that may be unfamiliar with Irish history and mainly to set the context for that first generation of Baker's Flat migrants who were leaving Ireland and coming to South Australia. So the Great Famine is always described as a, like a watershed, a turning point in Irish history. And I think that's not without reason, because when you look at what happened during the Great Famine, it was so significant for the people that came afterwards. So in the 19th century, the poor of Ireland relied almost totally on the potato crop for food. And there were frequently small failures of the crop or regional failures of the crop. And people were used to what they called the hungry months, the time between when the last of the potatoes were eaten and the new potatoes came in for the next harvest. There was always a time every year when people were hungry and used to it because that was just part of the pattern. But between 1845 and 1850, the entire potato crop failed totally across the country. Now this also happened in other parts of Europe at the same time because it was all caused by the same blight. But it did not lead to the devastation in other countries that it led to wholesale in Ireland. So the picture on the screen is from an 1847 painting by Daniel MacDonald and it's called The Potato Blight. And it shows the family they're uncovering their stored potatoes. So these are the potatoes that are, they're stored, they're going, let at least them be okay that we can eat them. And they are ruined by the blight and they're just rotting in front of your face. So this is like a horrendous thing to live through. And the result of this potato failure was mass starvation, disease and emigration. So the famine is also known in Irish as Ungerthen War, which translates as the Great Hunger. So compounding the widespread starvation across the country, the political complexities of the Irish-British relationship, and remember that like, Ireland was Britain's first colony, and the dominant laissez-faire economic policies meant that assistance was both delayed and inadequate. So the British government was reluctant to interfere in the free market. Grain continued to be exported from Irish markets. Rents continued to be collected and huge numbers of evictions took place, and landlords often took advantage of the turmoil to clear the land and to implement more modern and improved farming systems. And this was at a time where the, the new sort of theory of improvement was really gaining ground across Europe, and people were looking to improve things all the time. The, the accepted estimate for population loss during the famine years, in terms of deaths, it's estimated that between one and one and a half million people died, and one million people emigrated. So it was the start of the massive Irish emigration. It was the start of the Irish diaspora. It was probably the reason why all of us are here in South Australia to some degree. Before the famine, the population of Ireland was more than 8.2 million people. By the early 1900s, the population was 4.4 million, so about half of what it had been 50 years before. And this occurred at the same time as the population of England and Wales doubled. So anyway, that was the famine. Back to Baker's Flat, where the Irish settled, 
and where at least some of them would have lived through the famine, and all of them would have had some experience of it or memory of it. One of the effects of the famine was a growing appreciation of, for the Irish of land and controlling land. It became more and more important in Ireland for the native Irish to control the land they lived on. And this led in the later 19th century to things like the land wars and the land league fighting for the rights to have fair rates and control of the land. And we see an echo of this at Baker's Flat in South Australia. So over the years, because remember the Irish of Baker's Flat were living there, um, not paying rent, basically squatting on the land, which seems to have been fine for the first few years. But after a while, the legal landowners, for various reasons, wanted either to evict the Irish, or at the very least to collect some money from them to get some rent. And this led to continuing conflict. So attempted evictions began in the late 1870s, and one is captured here in a mural in the town. So this is part of a, a large mural on the side of a shop, um, and it shows a group of spirited Irish women with boiling water and spades and brooms, and they're throwing the bailiffs off their land and fighting for the right to continue living on it. So this is just one of many occasions of conflict on Baker's Flat. So there was another occasion when some workmen were trying to fence a part of the land. And this was an attempt by the legal landowners to establish that ownership. So we're going to fence part of the land, we're going to put some sheep on it, and you know, then we've got control. So as they dug the um, holes for the fence posts, the women sat in the holes so they couldn't put the fence posts in. And apparently threatened to throw things at them that they had gathered off the fields where the cows were on spades. <laughs> and the men were fearful and they left. <laughs> they did come back on another occasion and get the fence posts in, put the fence posts up, but by that stage the men had arrived home from the mine and that night they just blew up the fences. Um, another time the landowner came onto the land and he was thrown in the nearby river, the River Light. His nephew was pelted with rotten eggs. And surveyors at various times and using various subterfuges went onto the land to try and survey it properly. And they generally ended up in the river light as well, along with their equipment. So these troubles, you can see there's a bit of a narrative, maybe that lawless thing that people were giving out about was actually, to some degree, true, but not with that reason, or not without justification. The troubles continued for years and eventually coming to a head in a court case which began in 1892, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, with the aim of selling off the land, and it went on for like 10 years. But in spite of all of this, the Irish remained in Baker's flat until at least the 1920s, paying no rent, they never paid rent, and resisting all attempts by the landowners to remove them. So photographic evidence shows houses on Baker's flat followed an Irish vernacular style. So that's the traditional Irish style. The two photos on the screen were taken on Baker's Flat in 1906. So this is close to the end of the, 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 the site where people, you know, it's the, the last people that were living on it, really. But you can see there's distinctive features of the Irish traditional house. So a ret rectangular design. They tend to be just one room deep. If they're extended, they continue that one room deep thing. They don't go backwards, really. Um, and a steeply sloped patched roof. And this is very Irish and not so essential in South Australia because in Ireland you need that steep slope to get the rain off your roof very quickly, but that is not something that we need so much in South Australia. <laughs> and this is an 1893 survey plan which was prepared for one of those ultimate unsuccessful sales of the land. Now remember the surveyors you know, that came onto the land often ended up in the river. And this was carried out for the Forster versus Fisher court case, which began in 1892. And the survey again took place under difficult circumstances. The surveyor was a man called James C. Lovely. He arrived at the train station, he told the cab driver where he wanted to go, the cab driver said no way, 
Um, but he persuaded him, and so he put all his equipment in the cab, headed off with the horse to Baker's flat. He arrived at Baker's flat, looked around, turned around, all his equipment was on the ground, and the cab driver had you know, headed back to Kapanda as fast as he could. So James C. Lovely was tasked with fixing the positions of the various trespassers' holdings. Now, he started off by telling the occupiers that he was there to survey for a new railroad extension, or a new railway. And after a while, people thought, I don't think he's telling the truth. And <laughs> to the extent that they said, you know what's happened to the previous surveyors, if you want your equipment to be okay, you should probably leave now. And James C. Lovey says, the feeling of the trespassers was so strong that I was prevented from completing the exact survey and measurements of the trespassers' holder, holdings for fear of a breach of the peace. So this is what he could do mainly from a nearby hill. And when we plot the river light on a, a, like a, a map of the a map from today of the site, you can see it's plotted too far to the north and west. So he did his best under difficult circumstances. But it is the only survey plan that exists of Baker's Flat in the 19th century. And it's important because there are strong clues about Irishness on the site in that map. So, see the, all these little black rectangles? They indicate how the houses were clustered together. And this is significant. There's no rows of streets. There's no apparent order. And the cluster matches a uniquely Irish rural settlement plan called the Clahan. And that's how you spell Clahan. Um, and they were widespread in 19th century. They were the most common rural settlement style. So all the dots on the map, particularly around the coastal areas, all around Ireland, all indicate Clahans. And basically a Clahan was a group of dwellings and outbuildings centered around a particular area of land. The people who lived there were often related through kinship, but unlike a standard village or town, the Clahan lacked infrastructure like streets and services like a church or shops. Houses within a Clahan could have individual vegetable gardens and people owned their stock themselves, but the majority of the land was managed communally using a cultural practice called rundell, which is a system of open field cooperative farming methods. It was also used in Scotland, but it's known as runrig in Scotland. So clans were widespread in Ireland from the 18th through to the 19th century, um, but they disappeared after that, mainly as a result of the effects of the famine, because the land was cleared, people moved away, and people were evicted. So as the Clahan was dying out in Ireland, it appears that Lund was thriving in South Australia at Baker's Flat. So Baker's Flat's a rural area, and the land had not been occupied by Europeans until the Irish arrived. So the practices that we see on Baker's Flat reflect the decisions of that community only. And I think that one of the reasons why clans have not been recognised in Australia until now, because this is the first one that we have seen or recognised in South Australia, and I think it's because they're very difficult to recognise by outsiders. Even in Ireland, lots of people don't remember them because by the early 20th century, there were a few clans left in Donegal in the northwest of Ireland, but pretty much they were gone apart from that. So in Ireland, it's not a term that people are that familiar with, although it was, only 100 years ago, the most widespread settlement system. But here in South Australia, if you were part of, you know, sort of the, the, the British or the English dominant power, and you're looking at Baker's Flat, it appears disordered, it appears chaotic, it's illegible, it's very hard to read the clustered dwellings as a type of order. And it's certainly difficult from the British perspective to see anything other than chaos in the animals roaming freely without fences. And certainly this is the story that was rec recorded in newspaper articles of the time. Chaos, tumble-down huts, wretched hovels, 
cows, goats, and geese all running wild and no apparent order. So other evidence that Baker's flat could be a common can be found in the records of the court case that began in 1892. And this was the culmination of many attempts over many years by the landowners to rid Baker's flat, flat of its troublesome Irish occupiers. So during this court case, the landowners offered some of the occupiers the chance to buy the land. And a series of affidavits highlights how the Irish were working together, and also the expectations of a like, mutual obligation and how people were working reciprocally. Reciprocally. So Thomas Jordan lived in a hut and one and a half acres. And he stated that the occupiers had already held two meetings to consider their position. So these are organized people. They're holding meetings to figure out what to do together. And that unless they could run their cattle on the whole of the said section, they could not live there. And until they were forced to leave, they had all determined to remain. So we're looking at a lot of decisions made together and the need to use all of the land to manage the animals. Another man, Michael O'Brien, who lived in a hut and one acre, he said he was a bit tempted, but he said, it is no use my buying the land, because if I did, the others would go against me. There's a lot of peer pressure. And that any person who did buy the land would not be allowed by the other occupants to live there. So there's a lot of sort of interrelationships and a lot of working together. And it also appears that a man called Daniel Driscoll was something of a leader for the people of Baker's Flat. So during that court case, he was described as their spokesman. And by one of the witnesses for the prosecution, well, he was described as the head robber Barabbas. <laughs> so the court records offer some insight into how the settlement was being run as Rundale. But it's notoriously difficult to see Rundale archaeologically. But one of the other distinctive features of the Clahan is its adherence to Irish vernacular architecture, so the traditional Irish cottages. And we should be able to see that archaeologically. So in February last year, we carried out a geophysical survey of the northern part of the Baker's Flat site. So a geophysical survey, we used two major pieces of equipment. We used a magnetic radiometer, we use ground penetrating radar, and basically what we end up with is like an x-ray or ultrasound of the ground and any reflections of things that have been disturbed. So we concentrated on an area of the site that looked from the 1893 survey map to have contained clusters of houses. And also when we had surveyed the previous year just looking at the surface, this particular area had had lots of bits of ceramic and bits of glass scattered on the surface, indicating that there had been people there. So this screenshot shows the magnetic radiometer results. And I should probably just say that we did it in February 2016, when it was 35 degrees. And we were pulling equipment over and back, and going, if we do another 50 meters, we can have a drink of water. And it sort of felt quite tedious and awful at the time. But we got really good results and that was what kept us going. So they're hard to interpret, however. Um, here we've got areas of interest, areas of interest or anomalies of interest highlighted in yellow. There's three, seven, and you can see they're sort of vaguely rectangular and they're clustered together. So my theory is that this is where we're going to find some houses. The other interesting thing as well is these straight lines. Can you see there's a rectangular line and there's triangular sort of shape there as well. Now they're reflections of some disturbance under the ground that we cannot see above the ground. My theory about the clusters up here is that they're houses. My theory down here is that these are sort of cropping areas or vegetable gardens of some way and that they were fenced to prevent animals coming in because the animals have the free run of the rest of the site. Um, but basically, area, this area up here was where we spent most of our time working. 
And this is an aerial view of the site at the moment. So it's basically a paddock, it's a wheat paddock. Um, it's a big field. You can see that there's no obvious structures remaining above the surface. There are several large pepper trees scattered throughout, and that's a, a very clear sign that there were houses there at one stage. The red squares are where we excavated in 2016 and 2017. Uh, this was an area uh, that I think possibly is a lime preparation area because there, there's a lot of evidence of lime wash on the houses. And this is area of interest three, where we excavated in 2016 and 2017, looking for a house. And this is us digging. That was mid-excavation in the first field season in April 2016. That was trench A at area of interest three. And you can see that here, what we're doing is uncovering a wall at the side of the hill. More on that. So during that digging, we uncovered about half a dozen leather shoes and 2,000 pieces of ceramic, a lot of rusty metal and 4,000 pieces of glass. We also found lots of butchered bone. We found some thatch and corrugated iron. So we actually found a roof that had collapsed where there was thatch underneath. On top of that was corrugated iron from a later roof and holding the patch together was Hessian. Um, we, a man, Pat O'Connell, who lives further north at a town called Navan, came down because he has on his property uh, an Irish house that was built in 1865 and that he actually lived in until he was five years old. And it has exactly the same structure of the patch with the Hessian and the corrugated iron. And it was built by Irish people. So that was really interesting. And he was really interested to see it when he called down as well. So during the dig last year, we revealed the remains of a dugout structure. And what I mean by dugout is a structure that's semi-underground, so it's built into the side of a hill. So the physical layout of this structure, as well as the presence of those domestic artifacts, the ceramics, the glass, the leather shoes, all indicates that it was a domestic dwelling, somewhere that people were living, rather than an agricultural store shed. And back in Ireland in the 19th century, dugout dwellings had the following features. They were built or cut into the slope of a hill. The gables and the front of the houses tended to be made of sods of turf or grass or peat. And the hearth where people cooked and got heat was at the gable end at floor level with the smoke escaping through a smoke hole or two smoke holes in the roof. Now the descriptions from Ireland often refer to dwellings that were cut into peatland so that was like soft and easy to excavate but it does show that the poor of Ireland were used to digging or familiar with the concept of digging into the side of a hill to create shelter. Now this dugout wall, you can see, this is the dugout wall here, and that is actually on a slight slope. So it's about a meter down to this floor surface here. So here we're looking at the bedrock of the site, and they've dug into the bedrock, which is calcrete, to create a wall. And then this is the floor with channels running east-west. And the floor is also calcrete because they're just digging down into that sort of limestone um, land, soil, land, rock. On top of the wall, there's a couple of areas. You can just see one here, there's another one further here, where there was uh, square cuts made into the top, which would have been supports for posts, which would have then created a wall and then a roof over it. Um, here, there's a cobblestone path, which I think is outside the dwelling, because just here was where we found the rubbish dump. So I think the rubbish dump was just outside, and the cobblestone path was also outside. But here, we're looking at the inside of a long rectangular dwelling. And out of interest, a lot of the um, people that came from Ireland to South Australia came from County Clare. And County Clare is also built on limestone. So people would have been familiar with that sort of um, rock to deal with and how to work it and how to do it. 
So it's rectangular. We found more flattened tins covered with hessian, which we think were the walls above the calcary walls. There would have been um, metal wooden supports, metal flattened tins covered in hessian, then whitewashed to be white. This is the doorway. There was a little um, a stone, a flagstone, that was the, the entrance to the doorway, and we found a door handle. So that was very exciting. Um, but it's not in the eastern wall, but when you're standing in the trench and you're standing on that land, the prevailing wind goes east-west, and in the afternoon it's very, very strong. So it makes a lot of sense to just build it facing south, which is out of the prevailing wind. And this year when I was on Ackle Island in the west coast of Ireland where it was full of clowns in the 19th century, and I spoke about this to the archaeologist there, and she was going, they do exactly the same thing on Ackle Island. They do an indent to build the door where it's not going to get caught by the wind. But overall, we're looking at a Sitka structure that has a rectangular shape, is one room deep, and about nine metres long by four metres deep. Of interest, well, for me anyway, is the hearth that we found in 2016 at the southern end of the bed dwelling against what seems to be the gable wall. Now, in the Irish traditional house, hearths can lie free, either in the centre of the house or be placed against a wall. And it's so distinctive that houses in Ireland in that traditional style are divided into those two principal types the centre hearth type, where it's in the centre of the house, and the gable hearth, where the fireplace is at the gable wall. So here in the dugout on Baker's Flat, this is the hearth at the gable wall. It's directly on the calcrete floor surface, and in front of it there's a deliberately made channel, which may have been to contain it or to, you know, sort of help sweep stuff out quite quickly. <clears throat> we found no trace of a chimney structure indicating that it was on the floor that it followed a very early style where it lay at floor level and then the smoke escaped through smoke holes in the chimney. So the absence of a chimney for directing the smoke was not unusual in Irish houses. Chimneys were unknown in many places until the 19th century. So it was really a 19th century innovation in Ireland, apart from in the big houses. But in the traditional houses, it was unknown. In 1843, travellers to Apple Island on the west coast described a village of about 40 cabins without a single chimney between them. And there are also references in the Irish folklore collection to people using fuel made of dried cow dung. And we found evidence of this during the excavation as well. So we found organic material excavated very close to the hearth, which looks like cow dung. And I grew up in the country, in Ireland, and so surrounded by cattle in every field. And when we dug this up, I'm going, I know what this is, but I cannot think what it is. It looks so familiar, what could it be? And eventually my brain kicked in and I went, it's cow dung. So all the students did not get quite so excited after that. <laughs> <laughs> About digging up poo. <laughs> But the local histories also record the Irish using cow dung as fuel, and in the Kapanda area, it was known as Baker's Flat Turf. So when you think about that sort of hard chimney feature in the Baker's Flat dugout, and compare it with colonial South Australia, in general, in colonial South Australia, building constructions pretty much adhere to the techniques that were common in Britain. South Australian buildings differed from those in other Australian states, probably because it was a settler colony, not a convict outpost. And there was a clear tendency, a very strong tendency, for settlers to set up permanent establishments as soon as possible. And generally they stuck to a Georgian symmetrical design with two main rooms under the main roof. And further rooms were added behind as was needed, either with a roof of the same design or a succession of lean-to roofs. And this is different from the Irish tradition of going linearly and just continuing the rectangle. 
In terms of chimneys, large stone or brick chimneys were used for most South Australian buildings from very early on in the settlement. And we could also compare that hearth chimney feature in the dugout with other South Australian dugouts at the copper mining town of Burrow, which is 80 kilometres north of Kapanda. And these were also built by mine workers, but this time they were mostly Cornish workers who burrowed into the banks of the river and created quite beautiful dugouts in many ways with carpets and windows and doors. So newspaper reports of the 1850s note that all the dugouts at Burrow had chimneys. And there's a drawing by William Cawthorn, who drew it in 1851. It's the only known visual record of the dugouts. And you can see on top, there's chimneys on top of all the dugouts. And apparently it was quite common for um, people in drunken states to be thrown down chimneys to cause a riot when they landed underneath in somebody's carcass. <laughs> so it wasn't just the Irish that were lawless. Um, an archaeological excavation in 2004 of a dugout at Burra also clearly identified a fireplace and a chimney in the northwestern corner. So it's still early oops, to draw conclusions because I've just completed the fieldwork for my PhD and there is a lot to catalogue and analyse because if you remember there was 4,000 pieces of glass and 2,000 pieces of ceramic and that was just what we found in 2016. We found the same again in 2017. Although I had gone out to say to students, I only want to find structures this year. I don't want to find any more artifacts. But we found them anyway. <laughs> so this is a selection of some of the pieces of ceramics that I'm currently working my way through. And you know, to anybody other than me, probably they don't look very exciting. But these little pieces here, are all pieces of teapots. And in that one dugout on Baker's Flat, I think we have conservatively six teapots in broken pieces, and maybe more than that. So those Irish people, they may have been dirty and lawless and drinking too much, but they were also drinking gallons of tea. <laughs> um, and there's some other beautiful pieces. There's a nice little piece of uh, ceramic uh, porcelain hand-painted teacup. Uh, and there's a lot of this pattern called rhyme, which is one of the very, very common, like that everybody had in the 19th century, because everybody had it. Uh, and it was uh, this very distinctive sort of scroll around the, um, the border of the plates, and then it's sort of a castle design. And we have a number of pieces of that. So yeah, there's lots that say that the Irish were, in many respects, living the same sort of life as everybody else lived as well, apart from the tea. And this very beautiful um, bow china teacup with a hand painted design on it. So they're just some of the artifacts that we're working our way through at the moment. But so far, all the indications are that the excavations have uncovered a domestic dwelling that conforms to that Irish traditional style. And it's quite different from the usual South Australian colonial style. The presence of a hearth, but no chimney, indicates that the structure may have followed this very early form of the Irish traditional house. And possibly it's an early dwelling on the house, given that the houses that were photographed in 1906 did all have chimneys. And further analysis of the structure and all the pieces of ceramic will help with the dating. We know from the histories that there was an Irish settlement on Baker's Flat, but the histories only tell us about one side of the story. They tell us about the chaos and the disorder that was documented in the newspaper reports and the court cases, and in the few pages that have been written up in local histories. The actual people who lived on Baker's Flat have never told their story, but the archaeology is revealing some of it, and that it wasn't all chaos, that there was order, and that that order took the particular form of the Klamon. So this is the first time that a Klamon has been recognised in Australia. And I do think the research is important because it can be the start of a greater understanding of the archaeology of the Klamon settlement system and of Irish domestic dwellings and artefacts. 
But even more importantly, I think it talks a lot or will tell us a lot about how people move to a new environment and how they adapt to a new colonial environment and how they survive and thrive. Thank you. And there is more information. It's my email address. I also have a blog. <laughs> <laughs>